I am coming to you today from the Texas Auto Body Trade Show. Well, I'm not there in person, but virtually I am there. And I'm talking with Raven, who is a collision instructor. She did some really cool research recently on what the gap is between shop owners and students. She did a survey of both, and I think you're going to find the results really interesting. I know I did. Stay tuned. Welcome to Body Bangin', your podcast for all things body. Auto body, that is. And now, introducing Body Bangin's host, Mickey Woods of Mickey Woods Marketing. Mickey is a former auto collision center owner and is now a marketing and business development expert to shops across the globe. Hey, everybody, and welcome to today's episode of the Body Bangin' Podcast. Thank you for coming back, or if this is your first time, thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you want to be notified of new episodes, they drop every two weeks. Click that notifications button. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure that you're following so you get notified when a new episode goes live. So today and for the next couple of weeks, we are doing some episodes from the Texas Auto Body Trade Show. And there are like a hundred gazillion people out there right now. Evidently, all the classes are sold out. It is packed. It's going off. If you're not there this year, make sure that you are there next year. It's every year in August. So stay tuned so that you can RSVP for next year. So today we are talking with I love collision instructors. Can I just say that? Like I've had some on before and I just love you guys. So today we've got Raven Hartkoff on. She's been in the industry for five years and now is a teacher. She's been teaching for two years. She is the lead collision instructor at Collin College out in Texas. Her official title, she told me, is a discipline lead, which I figured she got to go around and just beat people up. But no, (laughs) I guess it's not that fun. So hi, Raven. <laughs> hi, thanks for having me. And yes, it's not uh, every time I say it's discipline lead, people assume that uh, people are getting in trouble, but it's really just overseeing like curriculum and instruction. So it's making sure we teach what we're supposed to be teaching as well as staying really relevant with the industry. Nice, which is super important. Yes, yes. Yeah. We're always you know, doing professional development. Uh, we come out here to the ABAT trade show to kind of see what's on the up and up and then we eventually integrate that into our uh, our instruction. That's amazing. I love that. So how's it going so far at the trade show? Are you having a good time? <laughs> so far, so good. Um, I did have a chance to come out yesterday for a little bit after work. And yes. I had uh, one student that was here with me. Uh, I bribed all my students to come out. So I offer extra credit if they do. <laughs> I think it's important for them to come out and yeah. uh, you know socialize with a lot of people that they're going to see you know, if they see him now, they'll probably see him again. It's a really, really small world in the collision industry. Yeah. So I say, hey, you never know where you're going to run into people. So That's I right. want to be comfortable kind of in that setting. But also, you know, there's a lot of like swag and there's you know giveaways and stuff like that. So for them, it'd yeah. be a lot of fun. That's amazing. I love that you do that. There's nothing wrong with a little bribery. <laughs> I'm good with that. <laughs> yeah. So I was talking with Jill Tuggle, who basically put on the whole thing. And we were talking a little bit about Raven. And she she was telling me that you had done some research recently that was really cool. And she's like, you got to make sure to ask her about that. So what is this research that you've been up to over there? So um, outside of teaching, I am actually a a graduate student at the University of North Texas. And I'm working on... Yeah, I'm working on my Master of Education degree. And one of my classes is called a field problem. So it's either a field problem or an internship. If you are in like um, higher education, then Mm -hmm. you can uh, just do the field problem. So I decided to do that. And my field problem was really understanding what, I guess kind of what the hiccup is between the industry and our students. So um, Mm -hmm. everybody knows that we've been saying this for years that we have a technician shortage, we've got a shortage. And then I have students that say, hey, I'm having a hard time finding a job. Interesting. Yes. Yeah, so it was kind of interesting for me to to kind of delve into what that topic looks like. Um, for us, I was really focused on Collin County because that's um, where Collin College is. So we primarily right. serve our county and I wanted to really understand what was going on um, with all the folks that are nearby. So yeah, um, 
Yeah, so I ended up finding at least there's over a hundred body shops in Collin County. Wow. And my counterpart, Marcus Godinez, who's also um, an instructor at Collin, he and I actually went out and canvassed the whole county. And um, out of the hundred shops, we visited close to 70. We want to continue on the research, um, even though my project's already officially done. Okay. But um, out of those, um, then we sent out a survey to them. And then we also surveyed students to kind of see um, what the trend is. Interesting. So mm-hmm. when you're sending out these surveys, what types of questions were you asking? So for the shops, I ask um, what kind of work they do, if they're mm-hmm. doing heavy hits, lighter hits, if they're what kind of paint, if they're doing um, restoration work, PDR, that kind of stuff. Right. I ask what, uh, what the average age of the technician was, mm. um, because I think that's an interesting one, just to kind of see um, the average age of the, the, the technician in Collin County. Yes. And then I also ask some other questions about what they value for certifications, um, mm. what's important to them. And then I also asked a lot about like salary, like what's a starting technician going to make? What is yeah. your, what is the average? So just kind of studying that, uh, that trend. And then what else did I ask? I asked about any kind of benefits that they offered. I think mm-hmm. that was on there too, mm-hmm. um, because I think that's important for students. So they kind of see um, what's out there for benefits, especially right. if it's not paying as much, maybe they're yeah. offsetting saying, Hey, we've got a great healthcare plan or something like right. that. Right. So it was really just kind of gauging um, that. And then I used a Likert scale. So it's the one that's where it's um, like you disagree or agree. And then there's all like mm. these little variations in the middle. So right. I did uh, some Likert scale questions that were saying, hey, I, I believe that certifications are important. And they say agree or strongly disagree. Right. And there, there's a lot of little questions like that. Just to kind of see, you know, there's yeah. a little information. Interesting. So I got to go back to the average age of the technician. What did you guys find was the average age? I'm curious. The average age, so far what I've seen, um, and this is the part that was um, out of the 70, we had about 14 respondents. So we didn't have a, a lot that okay. responded. That was unfortunate, but um, yeah. it's a sample size. Right. Out of what we saw, we generally see around 45 to 55 is the average age. But I okay. did see uh, one response that was closer to 60s. Yeah. And then one that had um, some in the 20s was more of a closer age, like a late 20s to early 30s. Interesting. Okay. Kind of a mixed bag. Right. Yeah. And I was expecting it to be a little bit older because um, mm-hmm. so much of the industry is aging. It seems as if the industry is aging and we're not bringing in new people. So mm-hmm. then... When you were then uh, conversely, when you were interviewing, like not interviewing, but giving questionnaires to the students, what types of things were you asking them? Like what was important to them type of thing? Mm -hmm. I asked, I first started out with demographics because I I wanted to see what that was. I mean, I have an idea of it, but even if I do, I need to have data to support that. So um, I asked for demographics, ethnicity, age, gender. If they said yes, that they were uh, female, which I've got, I'd say about one in five of my students are women. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. Um, but then I asked an additional question on there about how, how comfortable they felt going into the industry. So mm. if you are a woman, how like how confident are you going in? So yeah. that was something I kind of wanted to gauge out of my, right. my women. And then after that, I asked if they were a first generation student. Um, I asked a little bit about like their socioeconomic uh, status. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if they needed financial aid. And um, then I also asked what they were responsible for paying for in regards to bills. So um, if right. I have some students that live at home. I have some that have mm-hmm. a family. So like the age range of students I have probably this year, I have some high school. I've got dual credit, but it's from okay. dual credit age 56. So wow. I, have a really, I have a really broad age range. So I want to really kind of disseminate that data because an 18 year old is going to respond a lot differently than my yes. 50, you know, right. um, information like that. And then um, what they needed um, from the industry. So whether that was going to be uh, benefits or ongoing training, mm. um, the big one has been uh, finding people to work with their schedule. So they, if they're going to school full time, they kind of want someone that's willing to work around that and let them work right. part while they're in school. Um, right. Right. That was my big, what I was really trying to get out of the information that I was putting together was understanding like, why some places will offer full-time and why the majority don't. And then yeah. you know, students end up at these uh, part-time positions. Once they're done with school, they stay there full-time. Typically, they don't bounce around. So um, in a nutshell, that's what I asked on that side of it, just to kind of gauge um, what what they need, you know. Interesting. So can I ask you a question? I'm interested for the females that responded. What was the response for them feeling comfortable entering into the industry? Um, not very comfortable. Um, okay. I, 
Yeah, and I only have out of out of the women I have, I have one that is in a shop, but it's um, she and her husband own the shop. So oh, okay. for her, it's kind of an easy, yeah. Yes. So that's my outlier in the data. But um, typically, yeah, they do feel a little uncomfortable. It, it can be intimidating, um, especially you know for a student that say this is maybe the first time that they worked on cars, right? Right. So maybe exposure for a year. They go out to a shop and then, you know, you're already not at your peak confidence level because this is new. And then yes. going into it, um, if you've got a great support system in that shop, then then that's great. I do have another student that works at a body shop as a body man helper and she's doing awesome. But right. it's that support uh, to get into that. So right. there is definitely a disconnect there for my women that they don't feel the necessary confidence to go out there and do it. And they don't want to just sit there and be in the office. A lot of times they would yeah. like to be helpers or um, in the shop, you know, yeah. maybe on the side. Right. Yeah. And it's difficult. I, like you said, you made a good point. It's tough entering anything new. And mm -hmm. then when the, when nobody's like you and you're potentially potentially going to be looked at like, what is this girl doing here? I, I know for somebody like me, it's a challenge. Like, let's go. I'll show you, like, you know, <laughs> bring it on, be as skeptical as you want. Yeah. I'm going to whoop all you. Mm -hmm. But also, I know the younger version of me would have been much more nervous. Yes. Dealing and with it's, something it's like terrifying. that. It's terrifying. Yeah. Uh, when, when I went through college, so I, I have my associates in auto body. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually get into the industry until several years later because I wasn't, I was that person that. Right go out there and do it. And then, um, then I finally did, which was cool, but yeah, there is a lot of uh, hesitancy to, to get out there and do it. So, yeah, um, we actually have some more women joining us for fall. So I'm actually going to conduct cool. a survey even beyond the group that I had in the summer. Um, so I've got a better sample size and hopefully some better data, yeah. um, to present, um, on that. So. And I think it helps too, that you're a female who does collision. That's, uh, in charge of the program, that is a teacher that assists mm -hmm. with more females coming to your program as well. Mm -hmm. So kudos to you, girlfriend. Yeah, Love it's, it. it's a snowball effect for sure. Like yeah. the first year that uh, call it, so the campus that I'm at opened, uh, I believe in 2020, and who knows if I got that wrong. But uh, <laughs> anyways, it been open a few years, and yeah. the first few years we didn't have any women in the program, and then mm -hmm. last year, yeah, I guess that would be maybe 2020. Last year, I had like five or six, and then I have more joining me this year. So I've got yeah. four or five more. Right. Yeah. So awesome. it's kind of fun. Uh, the women tend to kind of run circles around the guys, probably because they have to feel like they have to prove a little bit more right. on what their abilities are. Um, but yes. I mean, they just, they really challenge um, the men that are... Good. You know, I think it's great. I think it, it uh, helps everybody be a better version of themselves. So that's cool. Mm -hmm. I'm going to interrupt this podcast for just one quick second because a lot of people wonder, Mickey, what is it that you even do <laughs> besides host a podcast? Well, I do marketing and really the biggest thing that I do is help you drive more traffic to your business and not even just more traffic, but consistent traffic to your business. As a former shop owner, I know how important that is. So if that's something you're interested in or you just wanna talk about marketing or developing your business in general, feel free to reach out. You can visit collisioncentermarketing.com. There's a calendar on there and you can just book a time that works for you and we'll set up a phone call or you can email or call me and my notes are down in the description of this episode. But I hope to hear from you. I'd love to help you build your business. But in the meantime, you better get back to this podcast because it's really good. So going back to the study as a whole, what do you feel like is the biggest, if there is, like, was there a key disconnect or a couple that you were like, aha, here it is mm -hmm. type of thing? Or what? where did you kind of land? I know you're not totally done, but where are you at mm -hmm. right now with that? I think our, for me, I think the biggest disconnect that I've noticed in the data so far is there is not a willingness to work around school schedules. Oh, that is the biggest one. Yeah. Really? And um, yes. And then I've even had students go to a shop and they say, hey, you don't need to go to school. How about you just quit uh, school and work full time? And right. to me, it's so backwards because it's like if they're going to do training with us, right? And they know a little more, like that benefits you in the long run. But I think right. a lot of folks are um, a little short-sighted in what their goals are. So mm -hmm. for them, they say, I need somebody full-time right now. And, right. you know, 
if they're good, cool. If they're not, um, you know, there's some uh, on the survey, there are some that said that they would hire someone with no experience, mm -hmm. which is fine. And you're welcome to do that. But there's definitely a larger um, learning curve yes. for people who don't have any kind of training. So you're, you're literally showing them, okay, here's a DA. Here's how you sand. Here's how right. you take a bumper apart, right? And if we can at least do some of that training with them, they're already exposed to it. So your right. learning curve is smaller. But we just ask that people invest, you know, a little bit of time in in our students like we do. And then you get them after the two years. So right. um, I remember I had one recruiter come through. So we get a lot of people that come to our campus because it's new. People like it. Like the walls are painted. So like people love that. There's AC. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of times they're like, yeah, I really want to hire your students. And I said, mm -hmm. cool. You know, I've got a cooperative education requirement, which says, hey, you have to go out, get a job. You get college credit for that. Mm -hmm. so I said, they've got this co-op requirement and it would be great if you could hire them while they're in school because that's right. a class week during the two years. And they say, well, we don't really want to do that. We would uh, much rather have them at the end of the program, like once they're mm -hmm. done. I said, right. cool, good luck. You're getting slim pickings at the end because all the good ones are taken by that point. So right. the, the shops that understand what we're doing and see the benefit are willing to work around that schedule for a bit. And then, um, you know, they, they essentially kind of keep them right after, yeah. after the two years. They tend to stay there. I don't have a lot of students that just hop from uh, job to job. They kind of... I guess maybe feel a sense of loyalty if they do get yeah, hired um, because they're willing to work around the schedule. And um, yeah. I even have a shop who's, oh, they're building another one. And he said, I'm, I want to hire more of your students. So I mm. need to fill that, that shop. So um, that's pretty exciting because I've got one yes. student there making pretty good money. So. And how is that? I mean, I was going to go there anyway. So this is the perfect segue. I've heard in the past, financially, a lot of students are like, look, I could go work at In-N-Out. You know, like I could go work at fast food and make more money than you're willing to pay me. And mm -hmm. I'm over here going to school and learning. I've got these skills, but yet you guys want to pay me pennies on the dollar. How mm -hmm. was that in your survey? And I'm sure different areas are probably different as well. But what did you find there? So what I found, I, I did ask one question for students and it was, what is the minimum amount you're willing to accept for a position? Yeah. And I saw a, kind of a wide range, but they kind of settled between $14 to $18 is what they're willing to accept um, okay. starting. Okay. So anything below that, like if you're offering $12, they're, they're not interested. And I don't blame them. I mean, I think inflation has been what, 6 or 8% in the past couple of years. So it's it's not feasible, honestly, to to work under $12 an hour. So yeah. that was the data I got for what they were willing to accept um, from the from the employers, I guess. And then I did also survey how much some of them were getting paid and some were getting paid on the higher side. So we're closer to eighteen twenty for some students. Okay. Okay. And that I'm sure varies state by state because, you know, cost of living and all that kind of stuff. Like I'm in Southern California. So... Most people don't want to get out of bed for $14 an hour anymore, <laughs> especially when everybody loves claiming unemployment. Uh, so I think this is an, I think it's an interesting thing because if there's any shops listening that are close by a trade school, I think a lot of shops take it for granted because not all shops have a collision repair program near them where they can take advantage of something like mm -hmm. this. And would love it. And then there's shops that have one right down the road and don't ever even explore it, which I find really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is a nice reminder to shops that although we're looking for people, and of course, you know, former shop owner here, if I got a slot to fill and I need a new tech because I'm slam busy, I want some, ideally, of course, I want to plug and play. But like you said, it's short-sighted because we can get somebody that you can develop with your culture, with your habits versus having to retrain somebody from another shop where they do something different. This allows them to get the education while they're in school. So I mean, it's really like a, it's a, it's a win-win, I think, if they're mm -hmm. willing, if the shop is willing to change perspectives. I think that's really all it is, is a perspective shift. Yes. And the, the shops that tend to hire my students tend to be those smaller independents. Right. So some of the, the bigger MSOs, and I'm not going to name any, I do have some that work at some of the MSOs, yeah. mm -hmm. but the majority end up at these smaller shops where they're say, hey, I can make an exception. I can work with a part-time for a bit, you know. Right. Um, that's kind of that's kind of the trend I'm seeing with students getting employed. It, it tends to be those. And also students talk. So if a student yeah. has a bad experience, you know, said, hey, they told me to quit. They told me to quit school. 
So I'm not going to work there. I mean, it, word travels. So yeah, um, it's good point. The how how cohesive our cohorts are because they do talk about that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. Very good point. People talk, and it's going to get back to it's going to get around if you're. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Uh, so I know we don't have much time today. Was there anything else you wanted to share that I didn't touch on? Um, no, not really, except maybe for all the shops out there to, um, if they if they do have the opportunity to hire someone that is going to school that wants to learn, like those are the people you want in your shop. Yeah. If they're going to school, they're, they're going because they have a genuine interest in it, right? And right. who are we to kind of deny them that entry into the industry? Mm-hmm. So I, I think we should really consider um, what benefits that that student can bring to your shop. You know, um, on a different note, we do uh, and we are working on partnering more and more so with some others. But we do offer like some other specific training at our facility. It's a couple of OEM stuff. And I'm not going to say any of it because I think I signed we signed an NDA on it. So I can't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> but we are working with, you know, um, certain vendors, equipment and OEMs provide some up to date training. So I mean, nice. it would serve in your best interest if you did have someone um, like maybe from my program or another um, institution. So that is something right. to keep in mind. Yeah. And just, is there anything that shops can do? And I swear I'll let you after this. <laughs> is there anything <laughs> shops can do? Because I feel like on the shop side, sometimes we get in our own way. Is there anything that we could do to help schools like yours out to be able to continue? Because I know there are a lot of trade schools that are getting shut down left and right. Mm-hmm. So is there anything that the, a shop could do to assist a program like yours besides obviously working uh, with and trying to potentially bring people on, that kind of thing? Anything out, outside of that that we can be doing as an industry to help out the trade schools? I think having an appearance, um, either going and talking to students um, is really important. They like to see that. Honestly, they get tired of hearing us talk. So it's <laughs> nice if we can get somebody else out there talking right? to them. Um, so that's a big one, but also being on the advisory committees. I I, mm. feel like I think pretty much every school out there, whether it's high school or post-secondary, they yeah. have an advisory committee and we use those folks in that committee to, you know, to stay agile in what we're teaching or, right. you know, there's, hey, we see that people need to know this, this, and this, yes. for example, EOS, EV, that kind of safety stuff, right? Those are things that we hear in our advisory committee. So um, for those that say, oh, you don't learn anything in those trade schools, it's like, okay, well, if, we, if we're not teaching them the right stuff, then how about you come in and tell us what we need to teach? You yeah, know? Right, you know, right. Put your money where your mouth is on, in that sense. You know, if you feel yes. like you're not learning anything, then come out and help us. Like we're yeah. here to help you all just as much as, you know, the students want to be out there. So right. being active in an advisory committee um, mm-hmm. would be beneficial. And usually there's not a lot of requirements for that. It's usually like you meet once in the fall and once in the spring. And sometimes right. maybe they do lunch, which is kind of nice. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's that's all that it really is. There's not a huge commitment out there to like be dedicated to it like once a month or anything like that. Right. Yeah, I've heard that before. The advisory committees are really powerful and they don't require a whole lot of time. So mm-hmm. I'm going to put the challenge out that if you are listening to this right now as a manager and owner, somebody in the shop run it up the chain and see if there's a trade school near you and see what that looks like to be on the advisory committee. It, the first step, I think, would go make an appearance. Go check out the class. Go see what it looks like. Uh, you know, Get your feet wet a little bit. And it could open up doors for you that you didn't even know existed, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you coming on, Raven. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you fun. so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm always so interested, especially with somebody like you doing research and you're passionate about the industry. So appreciate you for everything that you're doing for the upcoming, I would say kids, but they're they're adults and <laughs> younger and older adults. <laughs> you got everything. I, I, still call them, I still call them all kids. It just, I, and they're yeah. like, sometimes they like kids, but right. uh, yeah, students, adult students. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, I'm going to put information, I'm going to put your contact information in the show notes. So if somebody is local to you and they want to reach out and find out more information, how to get involved, then your information will be in the show notes. And again, thank you for coming on and enjoy the rest of your time at the Texas Auto Body Trade Show. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. I appreciate you. Accept that challenge. Get involved in your local trade show or trade shows, 
Well, those two, <laughs> your trade schools. <laughs> and if you already are involved in one, put some comments below and share us what that's share with us what that's done for your shop. It'd be awesome to hear from you. All right. Have a great one. Bye. If you enjoyed today's show, make sure you hit the subscribe button. We have some incredible topics and guests coming your way you will not want to miss. If you are watching on YouTube and don't want to miss the latest and greatest, you'll want to hit the bell after subscribing so you will get a pop-up each time a video podcast goes live. To our devoted fans, would you mind paying it forward and sharing this little gem with someone else you think may benefit from it? Much love from all of us here at Body Bangin', all things auto body.